of you who are here. I appreciate you uh, being here. Um, as uh, Nida said, I am Tamara Thorpe, the Millennials Mentor, and my leadership work focuses around helping young professionals um, become better leaders and helping organizations leverage their multi-generational teams. So I'm going to um, talk about today the challenges that come with a multi-generational team and workforce and how people of all ages can more effectively work uh, together and develop mentoring relationships that facilitate that process. So because we're going to do a lot of talking today about generations, I want to make sure that we're on the same page and define the four generations that we'll be speaking about. So you'll see here that I've identified four generations, and some of you may have seen this before and perhaps the years are different, plus or minus one or two years, there is some variation in the research, and perhaps wherever you are in the world you might have different terminology for these generations. Um, and so I'm using the terminology most familiar to me and my context in the United States. And uh, we are talking about Millennials, and so Millennials are the uh, newest generation into the workforce born between 1981 and 2001 and in this part of the world this generation is sometimes is also called Gen Y. We're also going to be talking about Gen X uh, which is 1965 to 1980 and that's the generation I fall into and baby boomers born between 1946 and 1964 and traditionalists born between 1927 and 1945 and in the US sometimes that generation is called the silent generation. Um, and so if you can it's really helpful for me often to know who my audience is so if you could put into the chat box which generation you identify with that will uh, give me a sense of who our audience is um, and uh, how you identify. So as we go on, I can um, be sure to address any generational questions that come up. Uh, Ms. Tamara, they're typing and I in their chat box. Well, okay. I'll, I'll let you know once they, I have a compilation of uh, average what uh, to what a millennial to belong. Currently, I don't have a number right now. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, what we know about the workforce today, back in 2010, Harvard Business Review proposed that in four years, which would have been 2014, that the people born between 1977 and 1997 millennials will account for nearly half of the employees in the workforce, and in some companies, they already constitute a majority. So let me give you some additional numbers about today's workforce. Today there are 1.7 billion Gen Y or Millennials worldwide. And Millennials represent 25.5% of the world population and will compromise seven, uh, comprise 75% of the global workforce by 2025. So in the next eight, nine years or so, they will be three-fourths of the global workforce. And what we know for organizations that are unable to retain their young millennial talent is that it costs approximately $24,000 to replace each hire and that 91% of millennials expect to stay in their job for less than three years. So this is important to understand that having tools and processes to retain millennial talent is crucial. One, because they are such a large segment of the workforce. Two, because 
replacing them is so expensive. And three, because their expectations for how long they'll stay at a company are quite short. So companies do have to uh, do more to hold on to their millennial talent. But it's more than just millennials. Additional facts that are interesting right now is that today there are 45 million baby boomers in the workforce uh, in the U.S. and that 52.7 million Gen Xers. And the research tells us that most baby boomers, at least 70% of baby boomers, expect to continue to work part-time or full-time until age 70. And so what that tells us is that for the next uh, at least 15 to 20 years, we will see more than two and three and up to four generations in the workplace. And so the changes in the workplace isn't necessarily due to the influx of millennials into the workforce, but it's actually due to the large presence of four generations in the workforce and how each generation brings a different worldview and different processes into the workplace. And so I see in my notes here that a majority of our audience are Millennials and we have some Gen Xers and that's fantastic. Um, I'm excited to see uh, more and more young professionals who are looking to hone their leadership skills and, and navigate the generation, uh, multi-generational workforce. So. The challenges of the multi-generational, the challenges these, this brings is one, the multi-generational workforce, and two, for a lot of you millennial leaders, uh, you're leading uh, people who are older than you, and this um, presents some different challenges around establishing your credibility, gaining buy-in, and being able to effectively uh, grow and move up the ladder in your career. And it can also, depending upon the cultural context that you come from, leading people who are older than you can create some interesting cultural conflicts. And so today what I want to talk about is what some of these differences are and how we leverage them through our leadership and through mentoring. So for those of you um, who are not millennials and those of you who are millennials, it's important to understand uh, that uh, millennials come into the workforce with some really strong values around collaboration, inclusion, uh, values around appreciation, a strong desire for growth and development, and mentoring. So the mentoring tools that I'm going to talk about today really are ideal for this new generation coming into the workforce. But what we know um, from researchers, generational researchers, is that uh, millennials view mentoring as a way to create learning connections with those who share their interest, um, and and it's how they and wanting to share that with people who know how to get things done. So we have to think about mentoring in many cases in a very new way, because mentoring isn't. Um, the way we used to think about it, where older, more seasoned, um, uh, uh, superior um, colleagues shared their knowledge with a younger, less seasoned employee. What we're seeing today are some changes in that uh, traditional hierarchical structure um, where there is more of a collaborative learning process and there is a greater focus on learning things that are going to impact the workforce in a more immediate way. So some of the changes that we are seeing in mentoring globally is that there are more web-based and online mentoring uh, platforms. So today there are lots of different companies um, and private programs and organizations that offer mentoring services in a virtual context and those are both formal and informal mentoring relationships. I for one use LinkedIn 
uh, to do a lot of mentoring for young professionals around the world who access me through that social media platform. And there is also a lot more sophisticated mentoring software that organizations are using in within their companies to have um, more complex matching so that mentor and mentee relationships can be more effective by sort of perfecting that mentoring um, matching. We're also seeing a greater integration of mentoring into um, the workspace and into people's lives. And so, you know, there were times when people would only have one mentor, and today people will have up to several mentors in different contexts, both within your company or outside of your work. And so having mentors in different contexts um, really involves mentoring being something that's more fully integrated into an individual's lifestyle and personal professional development. And so because all of these mentoring relationships are not formal, we are seeing more informal mentoring. And informal mentoring is something um, that takes on a whole you know, a whole new category because informal mentoring can be a simple exchange. Perhaps you're at a conference or an event and you meet someone and in a very short serendipitous conversation they share information that's very powerful and, and that serves to mentor you and in, in, in support an individual's development. And so those informal mentoring relationships um, are playing a greater role. And today a lot of organizations are practicing reverse mentoring. And this is a, a, a spin on what we see with traditional mentoring where younger professionals are mentoring more senior or seasoned professionals. And for me, I think that that's not enough and that um, there is a lot to be learned regardless of someone's age or regardless of how long they have been in the workforce. And so that's why I want to talk about mutual mentoring as a tool because mutual mentoring is a non-hierarchical mentoring relationship where learning is both mutual and reciprocal. And in a multi-generational workforce, this is essential. This is about identifying the skills and assets that every member of your team brings, putting value on it, and matching people so that everyone in the organization is benefiting from what everyone knows um, and has to bring into the workforce. A few years ago, I did a survey of millennials to find out what it is exactly that millennials um, thought that they brought into a mentoring relationship. And a lot of what they bring relates back to those values that I talked about earlier. Collaborative skills, communication, and it's not just technology. And so it's important that organizations understand that millennials bring more to the workforce than their greater understanding or greater ease with technology, but that their abilities to communicate, abilities to work in teams, and their knowledge is essential. And what I mean by knowledge is that um, millennials who have just recently finished their education are coming into the workforce with new ideas, new strategies, new practices, new theories, um, than from those who may not, uh, who have finished their degree maybe 10, 20, 30, or 40 years ago. A great example I like to use are teachers um, and that, you know, if someone who's been teaching for 30 years, uh, that there's a wealth of knowledge and experience they have in their practical training and having worked in a classroom and their understanding of, of classroom dynamics and pedagogy. But for students who just finished their teacher education, there are so many new concepts around learning and child development that are uh, bring value to someone who has been out of the um, uh, out of their own learning and uh, college education for a long time. So it's important that we identify that every generation has value, has something to bring and offer, and that those mutual mentoring relationships 
um, really offer two great benefits to an organization. So if you want to talk to your organization about mutual mentoring and why it would be beneficial, two key areas are cross-training and succession planning. So let's talk about what that looks like in real context. First of all, with cross-training, what this means is that within an organization, when people are mentoring one another across roles, for example, then they learn each other's job. And it is so essential within an organization that there are more than one person who knows how to do any given job. This strengthens an organization's intelligence by having multiple people within your organization who could fulfill multiple roles. And cross-training facilitates that process. It also creates communities of knowledge within your organization where everybody in the organization is committed to learning and development. And this makes your organization stronger, particularly when it has to face any kind of change like restructuring, policy or procedure change, leadership changes. When you have people in the organization who are accustomed to learning from one another and knowing each other's jobs and knowing how things work at different levels of the organization, it really prepares that organization to be able to take on more, um, take on more and face greater challenges. It also then, um, this mutual mentoring promotes that collaboration across differences, whether it be age, whether it be role, whether it be education and training, and it allows people to develop, develop skills in new areas. And this is so important in retaining talent that people are learning new things and feeling as though they're challenged. And this again is important for succession planning because you will have people um, leave the organization and we must always organizations that are healthy and proactive are always preparing for there to be people who are coming and people who are going and this mutual mentoring and cross training facilitates that succession planning so that when someone does leave a role that there are people who are able to come in and fulfill that role for them and that gives your organization a competitive advantage because you are more prepared and more ready for that type of change and transition. And then it also enhances performance and career growth. It is so important, as I mentioned, particularly for new, young, emerging talent, that they are able to uh, grow and develop. And those who have been around for a long time do have a lot to offer. And that knowledge must be transferred to a new generation, otherwise um, it gets lost. And when organizations lose that type of intelligence, it can be very timely, um, time consuming and expensive to rebuild that institutional knowledge. So mutual mentoring really facilitates that le a high level of cross training and succession planning so organizations are prepared and ready, people are engaged and developing and growing. So it's important that we understand that in addition to mutual mentoring that it requires a couple of things. The first thing that is important for mutual mentoring relationships to be successful, what I call the first ingredient, is that your organization cultivates and nurtures an age-friendly environment. So this just isn't about organizations that are bringing in new and young talent, but that people of all ages are valued and efforts are made not just to retain millennials, but efforts are made to retain people of all ages so that they're valued and efforts are made to recruit and retain. In my part of the world, in the United States, we see more and more organizations making efforts to recruit and retain baby boomers for a longer period of time and um, keep this multi-generational uh, workforce engaged. And that's an important element and it requires 
more than um, just coincidentally having multi-generations in the workforce. It really requires an intentional strategy to work to ensure that all generations are represented and engaged in their work. And this kind of age diversity um, brings a lot of value like any other type of diversity. It facilitates that knowledge and skill transfer that we talked about for cross-training and then that mutual mentoring really facilitates that knowledge transfer, that learning and um, allows re people to build relationships across difference. The second ingredient is generational competence. And generational competence is a relatively new term and that is um, I have defined here as the ability to communicate and behave effectively and appropriately in intergenerational situations based upon one's own uh, generational knowledge, skills, and attitude. And so what that means is that people of all ages are um, understand that generational differences exist, they're open to those different worldviews, they have the ability to understand how that worldview is different from their own and then they're able to adjust and adapt their behavior so that they can be effective and appropriate in an exchange. And so let me talk a little bit about what that looks like in the workforce because one of the things that I hear a lot in my work is how different millennials are in the way they approach work and I'm sure for those of you who I identified as Millennials you have heard people um, criticize or characterize how Millennials in the uh, work in the workforce um, in ways that aren't positive and so that's why generational competence is important because this isn't about correcting or fixing any generational group so this isn't about getting rid of the old guys and this isn't about fixing the young people. This is about everybody understanding that because of the context in which you were raised, your worldview is very different. And so um, an example that I see come into conflict all the time are between baby boomers and their definition of hard work and millennials and their definition of hard work. And what we see across all generations is that each generation has a different work-life balance. And baby boomers probably are most known for their very poor work-life balance. They're the workaholic generation. They're the generation that are very comfortable putting 40, 50, 60 hours of work into a work week. This is normal for them, and this is how they define hard work. And so millennials who have a very balanced work-life balance um, do not see themselves putting in those type of hours. Not that some don't because some do. Um, but millennials strive to have a greater work-life balance as do Gen Xers. And so the way hard work is defined we see those generational variations and so it's important because millennials definitely work under the uh, uh, motto of work smarter not harder and because of their uh, comfort and your ease with technology using technology to expedite processes and procedures to get your work done more effectively uh, is something that you highly value so that you have personal time, family time and that often is not recognized by more, um, you know, baby boomer or Gen X um, colleagues. And so this comes into conflict. So it's important that there's a lot of communication around how companies and specific organizations define hard work, define success, and how companies want to use technology in different processes so that everybody understands that everybody's contributing um, to the organization. 
Um, one of the things that we see also then is how different generations use technology and how they view technology. And um, technology can often be a divide, not just in how well people use it, but how people use it. And so millennials are much more comfortable texting and using different social media platforms. And Gen Xers and baby boomers, even though they might know how to use it, they're not as comfortable. Baby boomers prefer face-to-face -face meetings. Gen Xers are, tend to do okay with face-to-face -face meetings. And millennials really want face-to-face -face meetings to be impactful. If they're not impactful, then they think that a lot of it could have been done using technology. So it's important that organizations look at these differences and one of the things that I tell teams all the time is when you're working together across generations, you have to have a conversation about how the organization uses technology. And if you're going to be uh, using technology, you have to determine when do we have face-to-face -face meetings, what are topics that we use the telephone for, what are topics we text about, what are topics we email about, um, because each of these platforms are used differently by each generation. My generation Gen Xers love email. We use email for almost everything. Millennials don't use email as much. If they do, they're using it primarily in the workplace and find email quite cumbersome. And so really defining how and when technology is used for business is really important. I often get complaints from baby boomers that millennials want to text them when they'd rather have a phone call. And you can complain about the difference or find a solution with the difference. And so it's important to have those conversations about those differences. Um, and these are examples of how generational differences show up in the workplace and why it's um, worthwhile to have an understanding of how these differences show up in the workplace. And once you understand them, it really equips you to do things differently. So let me talk about what that is specifically. When we understand how each generation is different and how they work differently, then we're able to more accurately interpret behavior. So rather than labeling millennials as lazy, uh, which is very common, particularly in the U.S. context, that we understand that they work differently. And from their perspective, they're working more efficiently. And um, it is very unlikely that they're going to work the same way that um, Gen Xers did when they were in their 20s or baby boomers did when they're in their 20s. And so it's really important that there's some dialogue around that so that we can more accurately interpret behavior. And for millennials to understand that when you're being criticized, that that usually is an indicator of a lack of understanding about how you're approaching work. And so you can use that as an opportunity to have some conversations about how they see things, and you can share how you see things to try to find some common ground. And then you can understand the value that is coming into conflict. Is it a work-life balance? Is it a communication value? And what is the value that's coming into conflict, and um, how then can everybody adjust their behavior? And then we can make different choices about our own behavior. Uh, not too long ago, I was working with a very large group of millennial professionals. And um, it was, became very clear with this particular group of millennials uh, professionals that they found email cumbersome and an ineffective tool for communication. However, their older counterparts used email as their primary tool of communication. And so we had to find some middle ground there so that everybody was communicating in a way that was, was effective. And so after um, spending some time together, this young group of millennials um, understood why their counterparts valued using email and agreed to be more responsive to 
the emails that they receive. And this had been creating a huge communication gap in the organization. And so we see something that was very easily resolved by a one, understanding, and then two, making a small adjustment in their behavior. And so when you're able to accurately interpret behavior and understand where the difference is coming from, and then adjust and adapt your behavior, we're then able to develop working relationships where people of all ages are able to accept differences and appropriately adapt their behavior. And mutual mentoring relationships this is an essential component. Those mutual mentoring relationships can only succeed if there is mutual respect and mutual understanding. And that is going to be vital to building a strong and an intelligent workforce. So in addition to those two ingredients, there's a couple of additional ingredients that I want to talk about. The first is training on generational competence. And so whether you do that in-house or you bring someone in, it will be important that within your organization there is some understanding about generational variances. Um, just when we talk about cultural variances. So for some of you who may work in a multicultural or, or a multinational workforce, understanding the culture of the people that you work with is really important to understanding who they are. And the same goes for generational differences. Um, if you, you know, really think about how much in the world has changed in the last 50 years, um, you can understand how it is that we all have such very different world views and value things quite differently. And so it will be important when we are working with a multi-generational team and looking to effectively lead and mentor across those differences that we understand the differences that we're trying to negotiate and that we don't judge them but we understand them as differences. And so you may need to do a needs assessment within your organization to find out where are the learning needs in our organization. If you're going to use mutual mentoring or any kind of mentoring as a tool for cross-training and succession planning, you want to do um, that based upon understanding where are the learning and growth needs within the organization. And then that information will really allow you to do some great matching um, and facilitate some great mentoring relationships. Um, also, it will be important that there is buy-in from the top to the bottom of the organization and that mentoring relationships only work when everybody is invested in them. And so this can't be something that people at the top decide should happen for people at the bottom. It really has to be something um, that everybody gets engaged and is invested in because um, mentoring takes time and it takes commitment and so it's important that it's something that everybody wants to do. Oops. And then, of course, this needs assessment and buy-in process is really going to help you with the matching system. And again, there are very sophisticated software programs available for um, matching, but it really isn't necessary. You know, depending upon the size of your organization, there are very large corporations with hundreds and up to thousands of people that implement mentoring, and that that software makes sense. But for smaller teams and for smaller organizations, uh, there are matching systems that um, um, you can, you know, use just using an Excel spreadsheet based upon um, that needs assessment, which also the needs assessment that can happen through um, surveys, it can happen through one-to-one -one interviews and conversations. There's lots of different ways to gather information about the needs of people in your organization and then use that to match people. And remember, that for cross-training and succession planning, you really are trying to think of, you know, 
best ways to transfer knowledge um, from those who have uh, an expertise in a certain area or people who have been in a certain role for a very long time and be able to transfer that to people who are going to benefit from that knowledge. And then it's also important that mentoring relationships, whether they're traditional mentoring relationships, reverse mentoring, or mutual mentoring relationships, that there are some agreements about the mentoring relationship. And that might include anything from when we start, how long the relationship will last, how frequently um, you meet, um, how long the meetings are for, um, and also setting some goals and um, some specific actions. And that really makes sure that everybody has a full understanding of how much they're investing in the relationship and what they expect to get out of the relationship. So you do, you want to set some guidelines around how long you're working together, how often you meet, and really identify some, some specific goals to that mentoring relationship. And then setting those goals, you really want those to be measurable learning outcomes. Um, because when we are investing this level of time and care into relationships, being able to measure the success is important. So um, whether it's specific competencies around a specific task, whether it's developing interpersonal skills where people feel more confident and comfortable using different tools or being involved in different processes or people are working together more effectively as a team, whatever the goals are, you want them to be able to be measurable so that you can really evaluate the quality of the relationship. Because if you're not getting closer to your goals, then you may have to adjust the terms of the mentoring relationship or maybe even have to change your mentor. And that's okay. Lots of mentoring relationships that seem like they're going to be great don't always end up great. And being able to recognize that and rematch people is an important element of um, successful mentoring relationships. And that's why the monitoring and evaluation are critical to the success of any mentoring relationship because, um, as I said, you know, lots of mentoring relationships aren't good matchings and they don't work out. Um, and so it is vital that there are processes to evaluate that and then processes to correct relationships and whether that's having a third party facilitate so that there can be um, an improved communication and working relationship between mentees or if that means people are rematched. But it's all of these are important ingredients to being able to mentor across generations. And if you are leading a multi-generational team, I truly believe that mentoring is, is, is one of the best tools that you're going to have to create a work environment that is age-friendly and where there is um, a lot of cross-training and succession planning happening. These are all tools that any organization should be considering and mentoring is a way to facilitate each of those. And so, um, so, so that is basically what I'm sharing with you today um, as a way in which organizations um, or and, and leaders can be effective with the multi-generational workforce. We know because of the numbers that it is a reality of today's workforce. Um, it is uh, not going to change for the foreseeable future. We also know that millennials are going to be the majority of the workforce and so there has to be an ability for former generations to learn from this newer generation and not just new, uh, the new generation learning from um, the older generation. There needs to be some reciprocity in this learning and development because, um, because there will be so many uh, of you millennials in the workforce. The way you work is very different. Um, but I encourage each generation to really identify um, the value of other generations and to see 
uh, and seek out mentoring relationships as a means to, to foster and develop um, a greater understanding of generations, uh, to increase your knowledge and develop and grow in your work, and to strengthen your, your teams and organizations as a whole. And that is my presentation for today. Well, thank you, Mr. Mara, for a very interesting presentation. Folks, we are open for the question and answer. You can either put your question in the chat box or you can raise the hand icon available on your webinar console. So we have the first question here. So let me go straight to the first question we have. And the question is, why is understanding the multi-generational workforce so important for leaders today? Um, as I was saying, it's important for leaders today because of the very large presence of different generations in the workforce. Um, and a leader's role is to uh, ensure that their team is, is performing uh, at high levels and is producing at high levels and are fully engaged. And if we have groups that are at odds and not working effectively together, you are then lowering your organization's performance and productivity. And so I believe that um, organizational leaders today must invest in their talent, their, all of their talent, and ensure that all the people within their organization are equipped to work across age difference, cultural difference, and more. And because we have such um, the reality of more than two, three, and up to four generations in the workforce, this is essential. You I mean the global recession, uh, this is a side effect of the global recession. Really, 10 years ago, there was an expectation that uh, the silent generation or traditionalists and baby boomers would move out of the workforce and retire. However, now what we're seeing is that they are not retiring and that they are staying in the workforce and expect to stay much longer and are delaying retirement. And so the reality today is we do have a multi-generational workforce and we have to be able to do that as effectively as we can to work together so that teams and organizations are producing and performing at high levels. Um, thank you, Mr. Mara. We have another question and uh, the question is, is it necessary to conduct surveys in order to critically examine the present and the future workforce to determine what they want out of their jobs? Um, well, certainly surveys can be very beneficial. There's lots of different ways to gather information from your workforce. Um, as I said, um, uh, surveys is a, a tool. You can also do um, interviews. You can do focus groups. Um, there's also different large group intervention processes that usually require a consultant or outside facilitator who can work with large groups to gather information about the needs of your organization. But gathering information is an essential tool to any sort of planning um, or any kind of strategic planning or development. So depending upon the size of your organization, you want to determine what's going to be the most effective tool. A survey can be very effective, um, but if you have a very large organization, you would want to make sure that you supplement surveys um, with some kind of uh, personal interaction with people. Uh, because surveys, people don't necessarily always reveal um, everything in a survey. Uh, so there's lots of tools uh, at people's disposal, but yes, it, it is uh, gathering that data is going to be import very important to evaluating the present and future of your organization. Thank you, Mr. Mara. I hope that answers the question for Ms. And we have another one, and the question is, has reverse or reciprocal mentoring programs effective in organizations? Uh, can you repeat the question? Has reverse or reciprocal mentoring programs effective in organizations? 
Yes, there's quite a bit of research that um, has identified uh, reverse mentoring um, and reciprocal mentoring relationships as effective. And in fact, it is a growing trend that more and more organizations are moving towards these type of mentoring relationships because the research is finding that both the mentor and mentee uh, are getting more out of it. And it is in addition to the knowledge transfer, as I mentioned earlier, it really is helping to build relationships and create stronger teams. And so when people within an organization feel valued, when they're able to contribute, and when they're able to work together more effectively, you are seeing higher performing teams and teams that are more engaged. When there's any type of conflict or divide within an organization, that impacts performance, productivity, engagement, and it becomes very costly and it becomes um, very time consuming. And so um, we are seeing today more and more organizations that are relying on these type of mentoring relationships and are uh, investing less in traditional um, mentoring relationships. Um, because there is such a large presence of, of millennials in the workforce and millennials are incredibly ambitious and very uh, well educated and so they have a lot of information they want to share and as I said it's more than technology and that's important for organizations to recognize that when they do reverse or reciprocal mentoring, that it's not just around millennials sharing technological skills, but really sharing all the other skills and knowledge that they bring into the workforce. Thank you, Mr. Mara. I hope this answers the question from Ms. Mariam. We have another from Mr. Abdullah. We have another question, and the question is, when different generations work together, different attitudes and communication style can cause conflicts and misunderstandings. How can companies encourage such teams? So you're right. And um, just like organizations who face other types of differences, um, having conversations and training around difference how we understand difference, how we are different, and how to negotiate those differences um, become really um, important. So um, when we are able to understand just how it is that uh, people are engaging differently, um, that is very valuable. So how do you do that? One, you can bring in experts to the organization who can talk about generational differences. Uh, you can bring in uh, experts into the organization who understand diversity and inclusion uh, because this really is a diversity and inclusion concept, right? That we have people who are different from each other that need to learn to better understand each other to work more effectively together. And so that's why the generational competence is an important ingredient to the success here because this requires um, some understanding. There is also tons of literature available about generational differences um, that people can read and understand how each generation approaches the workplace. Um, and so something very simple and, and cheap that an organization can do is assign reading and bring this up in team meetings and work meetings to address uh, you know, different values and different issues, they come up and to have open, respectful conversations about these differences and then negotiate how to bridge them. So examples I gave earlier about, you know, when, you know, when do we use texting and when do we use email and when do we call each other? These are important conversations that could resolve a lot of conflict if people had them up front or had them in some team building exercises to ensure that everybody's on the same page. Um, and then again, really respecting and valuing that everybody brings something to the table. Uh, young people are very guilty of writing off old people and old people are very guilty of writing off young people. And this is an attitude that has to shift 
because it denies everybody the ability to be appreciated and accepted. And when people are not appreciated and accepted in the workplace, then they're not engaged and they're not performing. And so that's why it's important that leaders really take the initiative because leaders set the tone and they set the standards. And if leaders aren't doing all they can to facilitate this type of understanding across difference, then the leaders are not doing their jobs. And if you as an individual are not making the effort to understand people who are different from you, then you too are not going to be able to perform at your highest and your best. And if we can understand and recognize that the people we work with, especially the ones who are different from us, really are assets and should be allies, then you can really leverage those relationships to your advantage. Uh, very often when I go into organizations, something I see is that people who have been around for a long time and they've been doing something for a very long time feel very territorial over the work that they have done and are less willing to share. And that's an attitude that needs to change because it, it lessens, um, it weakens an organization when people aren't sharing information. That's just that's just key. When people in an organization aren't sharing information, the organization is weaker. The team is weaker when they're not communicating. So understanding these generational differences is uh, uh, essential. And it's three things. It requires a shift in attitudes, which I've talked about. It requires some knowledge, which I've talked about, right? So you, one, have to shift your attitude to one that is open-minded and where you're not judgmental. There's the knowledge where you can read and gather information about each generational cohort. Um, and then again, because there is um, cultural variation, you know, you, you want to understand how these generations have been shaped differently in your cultural context. And then there's skill. And the skill really is about having good communication skills. And one of the things that every single person can do is listen better. And the first and most effective way to improve your communication is to start listening better. And that means that you really are listening at a deeper level where you're listening to understand how people are different at a values level rather than dealing with the surface issues. And a lot of conflict can be resolved if people are just listening better. So shift your attitude, get some knowledge, and really take the time to communicate more effectively and listen more effectively. Thank you, Mr. Mara. We have another one from Ms. Fatma, and the question is, have you seen any generational differences cause conflict at work, and how could it have been avoided? Um, so yes, I see a lot of generational conflict in the workplace, um, and, and I think, as I said, all of it could be avoided with um, training uh, and shifts in attitude and more listening and organizations who are willing to recognize that the differences exist, that everybody has value and start having conversations about how these differences affect how people work and then um, and then adjusting. So I'll give you uh, two uh, clear examples. Um, working from home in the US is becoming um, a, a higher higher demand, right? So that young professionals, more so than any other generation, want to work from home more often. And this has to do with the high cost of childcare, this has to do with parenting styles, um, and, um, and young professionals want the ability to be able to be at home with their children more often or to be home more often to take care of ailing parents. And uh, we see that um, with large companies like Yahoo, for example, a few years back changed their policy so that employees could no longer work from home as often as they had been. 
and this created such a conflict that that internal memo to staff was released to media and the Yahoo CEO got quite a bit of public backlash for having made this decision. And so we see um, these kind of things can really become uh, a much larger problem when we're not addressing the different needs of our employees. Um, and I just a few weeks ago spoke with an organization that was facing the same conflict. They had uh, an employee who wanted to work remotely to care for her parents and they wanted her in the office. And this is something, again, it's not a black or white decision. This requires some intentional conversation and negotiation so that what needs to happen in the workplace can happen and what can happen remotely can happen so that employees um, are able to do their job as effectively as they can. And um, this again is one of those uh, generational perspectives that really is shifting the workplace that needs to be navigated and negotiated uh, very intentionally um, to find a, a common ground. Thank you, Mr. Mara. So that brings us to the end of this webinar. Any concluding remarks from your side before we end this session, Mr. Mara? Uh, no, I, I want to thank everybody for your very thoughtful questions. Um, I, I appreciate you joining me and asking me such thoughtful questions. Um, I have written about this topic and those papers are available on my website, tamarathorpe.com, for free. Um, and so I would encourage you to visit the website and um, see, um, download those white papers. Um, that talk quite a bit about mentoring and how it's evolved and how leaders of all ages can use it as a strategy to working with multi-generational teams. You can also, of course, follow me on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn, um, and I, I'm happy to connect and share with all of you. Once again, thank you, Mr. Mara. I really want to thank you on behalf of Gulf Business Network and Training Center for your valuable time and sharing valuable information with us. And thank you all of those who attended this webinar. We are recording this webinar and it will be uploaded on our website. So please stay tuned to the webinar dot, to webinar.gbntc.com for updates or for downloading the soft copy of this presentation in case you have missed it. With that, I'd like to end the webinar and you all will be automatically dismissed once the session ends. Thank you. All, thank you very much and you all have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Mara. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.